I was muted. Uh, so once again, hello, welcome everybody. Hello, Lily. Um, this is our second Hi. meetup in this series. Uh, we'll be talking about TypeScript today. Uh, in the past few months, uh, this series ran as kind of like preface to the FOSDEM conference. And even though the FOSDEM uh, 2021 is over, the organizers of this meetup love open source, so they decided to continue running uh, those events. Um, you can find the recordings uh, from the previous sessions on the website, uh, contributing.today uh, slash past hyphen sessions. You can find some uh, recordings on Python, Golang, Rust, and many more non runtime related topics. And uh, you can also go check out the website and uh, see what uh what there is for the next week a bit of a spoiler we'll uh we're planning to have machine learning uh, my name is alexandra i will be one of your hosts today i'm working as a tech lead at hasura and uh you may know me from twitter i'm co-organizing roswap typescript meetups and um my co-host is lily over to you lily I think uh, that Lily has a uh, few problems. Uh, Lily, you are muted. Okay, so in the meantime, I will continue uh, when uh, I think uh, Lily will rejoin and then uh, she will introduce herself. So um, I just wanted to mention a few points uh, before we start. We have a code of, co code of conduct. You can find it on the website, uh, contributing.today slash code hyphen of hyphen conduct. And, um, and we will be like monitoring the chat. So please be kind to each other. Um, also the chat is on Discord. So you can join the Discord server and uh, feel free to ask questions, leave comments, and so on. And this whole meetup is uh, is being made possible by, by Microsoft. And also we are using uh, contributing today hashtag on Twitter. So feel free to, to use it as well. Lily, are you back with us? Hi. Hello. Am I back? Yes. Excellent. Perfect. So hi, uh, my name is Lily. I'm a technical services architect at Nick. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, generally, I work very closely with customers building custom TypeScript solutions. Uh, previously, I was a lead engineer at Nick in one of the languages teams, learning a lot about different package managers, how the different uh, dependency resolution algorithms work. So I know a lot of uh, useless trivia about that, if anyone is interested. And generally, when I'm not coding, I like to hang upside down and do circus things. That's me. Awesome. So let's take a look at the agenda, what we have for today. So at first, we we'll have TypeScript panel discussion with Orta and Daniel. Then uh, we'll have presentation by Ashugul on Babylon JS with TypeScript. And then uh, our host, Lily, will tell us about TypeScript projects at SNCC. But we'll also have a little surprise for you. So Lily, do you want to share some details? Absolutely. So there is a raffle today. And we are handing out several copies of Stefan Baumgarter's book, TypeScript in 50 Lessons, which he published in collaboration with Smashing Magazine. So very exciting. Uh, our speakers will be aiding us in awarding books for the best questions. So please submit your questions in the chat. Awesome. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce our first two speakers. Uh, Orta and Daniel will uh, talk about TypeScript language, language decisions. And uh, Orta is a software engineer at Microsoft. Uh, you can know him from 
all the amazing work he's doing on TypeScript website, docs, and handbook, and everything else. And Daniel is a program manager for, for TypeScript at Microsoft, and he's a frequent author on the devblogs.microsoft that comes slash TypeScript and he's writing all this amazing uh, posts on the like upcoming releases. So, so over to you. Uh, it's very kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, thank you for having us on today. Um, on contributing that today. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I, I um, not exactly sure where to get started. If there's anything that you all want to hear first, uh, if you have any, I think an interesting one might be like what's happening with TypeScript right now. What's coming up? Uh, well, next week uh, we are coming out with our 4.2 release. Mm -hmm. um, it is pretty jam packed with features. Um, there are a couple of really cool highlights that I'm excited for uh, that I can I can speak to. Um, I'm sure Orda can as well. Um, and uh, if if you're able to now, we already have the release candidate, which is um, a good opportunity for people to try it out. Let us know if there are issues. Uh, so we always appreciate those. We have a beta, a nightly, and an RC. But uh, I'm sure a lot of you are just looking forward to what's coming up. Um, I think. You know, or maybe this is like on your mind too, but I think the better type display thing is probably like the thing that I, most users are excited for. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, I, I can dive into that a little bit. Um, yeah, you definitely should. <laughs> so um, for, for the better type display, um, you know, if you've, if you've used TypeScript before, um, you often have. You know, you've, if you use this language, you've seen how flexible it can be, right? Um, and I often say that with that flexibility, with a lot of that work, we've got, ended up with like what I call UX debt, right? Like you can you end up seeing these these very powerful types displayed in the editor. They're displayed in your declaration files, um, and you end up with 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 pretty gnarly, nasty, big types. So, for example, like you might have a union type that has like a thousand members in it. Um, because you use this operator called key of, which shows you all the property names. And if you have like a thousand properties, you're going to have a thousand like string literals in the union type. And that's um, super common with people doing stuff with CSS or React. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like if you've, if you've used React in like a non-trivial way, I'm sure you've seen this, right? Um, but uh, so so one of the things that we're, we're trying to do is um, when, you, when you write a type alias, you know, if you've written the word type foo equals whatever, um, we we do a little bit of extra work. We we actually attach that metadata to the union type if we can, and we say, hey, this was declared as a union type. Uh, oh, sorry, as a type alias. Whenever you use that union, we're gonna try to to recover that information. So if you union with something else, you know you won't necessarily just see like a big old union with another type. But we'll actually try to say like. Take take that original type alias and union it with something else, which is not necessarily how it's represented internally. We actually represent it with like what's called a non-normalized form, uh, which is just a <laughs> very, fancy very way of very saying like, yeah, it's like it's a fancy way of saying like we don't try to like keep the type in a a a easy to reason about <laughs> uh, representation. So like yeah, it doesn't it's, just, it's a bit like the literal version of it, right? It's like the as if you had wrote it out manually yourself, const a equals blah blah blah. It, exactly. Like the crux of it is we're trying to like just keep the representation of like what you would have written, right? Every single time you create a new union or you create a new key of or whatever, we're just gonna say, like, okay, did I have that old information? Try to construct what a user wrote there. And if it doesn't end up being, I think like um maybe if it ends up being bigger. <laughs> than what you would have written out if you read that actual union type. Like, we'll show you that. Um, and this is like, this sounds like, oh, well, they're just working on like type display. Like, yeah, uh, <laughs> this is this is like a big deal actually, because um, for, for years, um, like this is just a big pain point for beginners, right? Um, and, and for years we've heard from like companies that like, oh, if I, as soon as I see this, like I'm overwhelmed, right? You see this in error messages. You see this when you hover over something in the editor. Um, it could be a lot of information. Yeah, 
Yeah, and and you know, part of the thing is like with JavaScript users, with TypeScript, you're trying to appeal to a lot of JavaScript users, people who have never used a static type system at all. If you see those error messages, like you're going to get overwhelmed. So like you have a lot of beginners who like a lot of the time they come from coding boot camps. They've used JavaScript for 12 weeks, and now you're saying like, yeah, try this out. Um, so 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 type display is a big deal. Um, and, yeah. and and it affects and, all JavaScript users too, right? So that's yeah. anybody using <laughs> definitely type behind the scenes, which is more or less every JavaScript user. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'd, I actually maybe a lot of people don't know about that. Uh, do you want to do you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, if you didn't know, TypeScript powers most JavaScript tooling. So if you've ever used uh, VS Code or um, or Sublime Text's um, TypeScript extension. So it, TypeScript runs uh, it's all of its tooling over JavaScript. And basically, whenever you get dot completions in an editor, that chances are, with the exception of like WebStorm, that's coming from TypeScript. Um, and in order to provide like rich libraries uh, of, of information for things that are not shipped with TypeScript, like the, the DOM API, like the web browser API, then there is a, a project called Definitely Typed, which keeps track of almost, I think you're in the 25,000-ish uh, NPM modules uh, and, and sort of web things. It's it's a massive project. Um, uh, and that keeps track of like what the files, what the, 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 the header files, if you know that from the sort of other programming languages or interface files, um, ways to describe existing JavaScript structures. And basically JavaScript people are using this without even knowing it at this point because of something called automatic type acquisition, which just grabs it under the, behind the scenes in your editor. Very powerful. Yeah, we've often heard like people in discussions saying like, "Why do we even need TypeScript? Like, I just get autocomplete in my editor." <laughs> JavaScript anyway. is so good. <laughs> it, well, yeah, I mean, I, that, that's sort of the funny part, right? Like, we don't consider that a loss, right? If someone says, "Oh, well, this is just really good. Why would I use TypeScript?" Well, they're they're benefiting from the tooling that we built, right? We just want people to be more productive, right? So, um, you know, that that comes down to like one of the one of the slogans that we have on the site, which is like type type JavaScript at any scale. Like we don't we're trying to accommodate you at whatever your workload is and what what your what your target is and what you're building, regardless yeah. of if it's like a big TypeScript app or if it's like a very short JavaScript script, right? <laughs> It's why I like to think of it as like a, uh, it's, it's a spectrum, basically. It is you, because TypeScript powers your tooling on the JavaScript side, you're conceptually using TypeScript, even if it is just a quick script, all the way up to I, I want the most like intense TypeScript experience with strict mode and all these extra flags whose job is to make your life a little bit harder, but know that you are definitely a little bit more correct because of it. Yeah, sure. Um... I think that we've got a question, which is, do we have the same concerns with using linters? Though I'm not exactly sure um, what the concerns are <laughs> specifically. Like, um, is the concern, I mean, maybe the concern is, um, like, is it a supplement versus, like, does it take over TypeScript in, instead of it? Um, like, what is the value of TypeScript versus a linter, I guess, is a question we might be getting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we, we've gotten that question for so long, um, but it's it's faded out over time. I'm trying to think of like what we used to answer for that. <laughs> I think TypeScript sort of stood on the foot of linters a little bit with some of its rules, but yeah. overall, in part, that's to power the editor experience in case you don't have a lot of those um, linters already installed. But yeah, it's, it's weird. Argue. Right. Well, I mean, like, because there's two things there, right? Like, there's the how much of TypeScript analysis is just like the same stuff as linters, right? Um, and then how much of it is um, what, what do we do beyond linters, right? Uh, I think, I think, yes, like you mentioned, right? Like, there are certain, certain cases where uh, it would have been inefficient to, to hand off some of the analysis that we do to a linter. Um, it used to be that linters couldn't take advantage of type information. Um, now ESLint has like a TypeScript, like a TypeScript support for ESLint, like a plugin. Um, so you can actually just say like, "Hey, TypeScript, give me give me the information that you've got, and like let me do some stuff with it." 
Um, but, uh, but I mean, it needs to get the type information from somewhere. And really what that comes down to is like, linters often work more on syntactic information that is local to a single file at best, right? So if you are considering, um, if you're if you're if you're thinking about like oh I want to be able to like construct some some deep information about this code, um, linters typically strict you know limit themselves to like a single file at a time. But even then, you need to actually construct like information about like where types are flowing in and how you declared things, and that's then you need some deeper analysis. And, and yeah. a linter in theory could build that, but like then you're just building a type checker, right? Um, so there's like a there's not a great distinction exactly. I think lint is also, the, the scope has changed over time. Like today, if I was using a linter, I wouldn't use it for formatting, for example. Like to me, that is now the responsibility of a formatter. And we have like good tools that take a sort of slice of what used to be a larger linter sort of concept. Uh, and now type checking is handled by a type checker. Linting is more about like the cultural rules of your team. Uh, and formatting is just, you know, one or two settings and then you forget about it. Yeah, and and that's I mean it's it's always a hard question to like figure out scope, right? Um, a lot of like the original design of, of TypeScript came from it came from the design of um, the Rosslyn compiler, which was this effort to say, hey, uh, you know, from the C sharp team, everything that we've been building the last 10, 15, 20 years or so, I guess it was like ten at the time. Um, what what are the things that we could we actually build a C sharp compiler? that is also the engine for your editor, that is also the thing that like gives you the all-in-one experience. And so when, when TypeScript was built out, like there was some sort of the same vision, like bootstrapping the compiler in TypeScript. Um, so it's all built in TypeScript, anyone who knows TypeScript can contribute. Um, and, and it also powers the editor too. And some of that came to be, right? Like, I'll, I mean, all of it actually did come to be, but it was more like, what are some of the cultural things that happen in the JavaScript ecosystem that like change that, right? So like, we have a formatter. I consider it pretty good, but- um, but I've shipped but, some like, code to it. Yeah, <laughs> So I right? use it occasionally. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, but I, I think another part of it is, um, you know, there are different, opinions that have come up in, in the ecosystem. And, um, you know, part of us, I think, in the community, we favor like loose coupling between tools these days. Um, there's a little bit of a pendulum swing between that, right? Like, I think we're going back to prescriptive for like all in one, but they're still built on like smaller components a lot of the yeah. time. Um, I don't know. I mean, would you say, <laughs> Does that mess with your view of the world too? Uh, yeah, a little bit. In fact, since I've joined the TypeScript team, I've stopped using a linter realistically. I only use it on the TypeScript code base. Um, I, yeah, I kind of do too. Like it's it's very bad to say because I think, like I feel like I'm not supposed to say that um, because like we have contacts on the VS Code team who contribute to the ESLint plugin and the editor. Um, but I don't use it because uh, I, I find a lot of the, the lints that are like either by default turned on to be a little bit too aggressive and, and, and jump at you, right? Like it'll tell you like a variable is undeclared in a very aggressive way, but like you don't necessarily care when you first read yeah, the variable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so it's it's strange. I do I do lean on TypeScript more, um, even like things about automatic semicolon insertion, they're often like not a problem if you have a type system to tell you like you're about to index into something instead of like writing an array yeah, yeah. with a bunch of commas. in the wrong place, yeah. Yeah, yeah, these, these, these things are like sort of true in C in like other languages like C and C sharp and whatever too, but like we don't care because you'll get an error yeah. before you run your code. Um, Ooh. Hey, Alexandra, uh, you're muted. Again, it always happens. So I have this question because uh, you've been talking a bit about like making developers productive and about the mm -hmm. fact that most people are coming from JavaScript world. So I have this question like, um, so there is this like pretty broad spectrum of like what uh, 
what you can get from TypeScript. Like on the one side of the spectrum, we have like, I will write my JavaScript code. I won't care about TypeScript. And then at the end, I will, you know, fill the gaps with a few TypeScript types. In many cases with any, because it may turn out to be, you know, hard to type. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have, I know, type-driven development. So I just wanted to ask, like, how would you, you know, kind of like push people more towards this type-driven development spectrum? I mean, not exactly to like the very end of this, but, you know, kind of like somewhere to the middle or maybe uh, more to this type-driven. Do you I want think to go it's nuanced? Yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's about projects, not people. So it's like, you know, an, an individual, I, you know, I know how to use most features of TypeScript nowadays, um, but I still write in JavaScript pretty regularly and just put a little slash slash TS enable at the top because I don't think this project needs all of the extra infrastructure that TypeScript need, does to make it to make it work. And so like you as an individual just need to be able to know how far you want to take that, that sliding scale. That's that to me is the interesting part. That's like, do people know that they can like just turn on JS doc support and actually get some rich typing information enough that they don't need to jump into having to maybe have Babel in there, having to have TypeScript in there. Um, or is this project so like mission critical that it just needs the strictest settings possible? Um, you know, I used to work on a React Native app, and if you ship a wrong version of a React Native app, then it takes a long time to get a roll uh, rollback done. And in those cases, we needed every flag that was possible, every single linter that was possible, just to make sure that we were 100% sure of the JavaScript we were sending. And so, you as an individual, you can you should be jumping between both, like very rich and very strict, uh, in in my opinion. Yeah, I think I think you alluded to something, which is like, what's your turnaround time, right? What is your what does your dev loop look like? Um, we we if you think about what enabled TypeScript, it was um, ES six, right? Like there was this time where we had all these browsers that were all ECMAScript five, right? They didn't run the newest version of JavaScript, and then bam. There were like four years, five. I don't exactly know, but like a long period of time where like the, the JavaScript committee was like churn, like working on these big features that were going to come out of the next version. And I think it like was waiting for like six years or something like that. Then they all came out at once. And you had like this divide of like, here's the evergreen browsers. And then here's like IE11 or whatever. And they're not going to run all the same the, the features. You need a compiler or something like that. You need polyfills you, if you want to use these features, right? And so TypeScript kind of leveraged, it, it had an opportunity where people were saying like, well, I'm willing to take these features. Oh, I'm also willing to take other things like, hey, what's this JSX thing? Or what's this TypeScript thing? And like, it's kind of, it was a very cool period. Um, but like, there's, that's that's the pendulum I was talking about before, right? Like you, now people are saying like, I don't wanna do this for every project, right? Like now I have run the latest node, it has all these features. How am I going to just get a reasonable workflow? That's where TS check comes in, right? Um, or like just the plain JavaScript support that you get in your editor. Um, we we want to be there for you, like, however. Um, but like, you know, thinking about things like how much should I be using any versus like, I think about the types of my signatures first and then I write code. Like that's that type driven development thing that you mentioned. Um, Again, I think it, it sort of depends, right? Like I, I personally try to do that as well. But if you are if you are experimenting when you're trying to learn about like you you have a goal in mind. You maybe you're building a project and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to get there. I know I'll probably use these libraries. You don't know what the libraries look like yet. So it's kind of like thinking about things in terms of type driven development really forces you to like stop and think and like deeply analyze like what libraries you're using, right? What are the data structures you're going to be funneling around? Um, if you don't have that time or you're not that type of person, like maybe you just like to try to like bang things out and see like, okay, what functions does it just have, right? Like hit dot and let me see what it has. Um, it's a very different mode of development, right? I think like once a project has matured a little bit, like type-driven development becomes a lot easier because someone has laid the groundwork to do that. 
if you're the type of person who likes to start a project with hyperdriven development, then it works great. But you might just be hacking. And that's like kind of the cool part of the industry is like there's room for both. It just depends on who you are as a person. It's my personal take. Cool, cool, thanks. And also if you are like um you're going into this type driven development and you write all those types for, for your you know functions, modules or whatever, then this kind of sometimes this implementation kinda like falls into like falls into place naturally. Mm -hmm. Like you know, with types you can figure out what you need even if you're like stuck and you don't know how exactly you're going to implement this. So that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, no, I, I love it. <laughs> But I didn't buy this. <laughs> I'm 100% the person that would start every project with TypeScript nowadays. Um, so I would be interested to hear, are there any tips or things that you would recommend to make it easier to get started with TypeScript from the get-go? Hmm. Uh, a lot of people just use blogs to learn TypeScript. We have really great documentation. Yeah. Um, we That's have a true. handbook and a version two of the handbook that has been a work in progress for a few years that should be coming out this year sometime uh, <laughs> that, you, that you can go through. It, yeah, there we go. Um, that is an incredibly rich resource, very up to date, and uh, covers not literally everything because doing so would make it very hard to read, but the stuff you need to be a very productive TypeScript user. Yeah. I, I do agree with that. One thing that I have been thinking about is um, the project setup experience where we may want to do a little bit more um, prescriptive advice and documentation in that regard. So like if you're getting if you're getting type started with TypeScript and you've already like set up your project, you've got like a TS config, you've got a build system, whatever. Um, that you know, I think we're we're already We've got we're well equipped to support you on on the website and our documentation. Um, I think you'll see improvements in the project setup domain as well going forward. Um, I think the uh, the other things that I would recommend are look into so, like certain low friction tools that will help you iterate quickly. Um, and this this ties into like how TypeScript just works with other tools in the ecosystem. Um, Something that I experimented with recently was this tool called Vite, or you might pronounce it Vita, but it's Vite. Um, and it uses a tool called VS Build under the cover, and um, your development time is like lightning fast. It's very quick. It's very easy to spin up a development server so that you, if you're doing front end development, um, I was very impressed. Uh, let me let me just put it that way. That, that's probably something I would I would like to call out. Um, so. So things that can help your your development workflow so that you're thinking about like the actual code rather than like the build tools. Um, I definitely understand where people are coming from when they push for that more. Um, yeah, I think TypeScript as a I think TypeScript as a team has done a really good job in the last two years of trying to persuade other people to implement TypeScript in their own tools. Uh, in part by just like lots of people, uh, uh, you know, feeling like TypeScript is big enough to support it, but also TypeScript, the team has done the work uh, in places like Babel. Um, but we're seeing now like the sort of next generation is a Babel um, and uh, like ES Build, like SWC and Sucres. All of these, like these are like transpilers in the same sense, but they're actually like much faster because they know what they want. Like we all used to try and guess what the JavaScript future looks like, and the future is today, basically. And so, all of these like bun like these modern tools are just adding TypeScript support natively to their to their actual uh, build processes. So using those uh, will get you a lot of speed in exchange for simplicity as well. Yeah, there's there's a bit of a trade off, and people often. Um... I think that that is something worth calling out, which is these are build tools and they don't necessarily type check the JavaScript or your TypeScript code, um, which which can often be confusing, but like the, originally TypeScript as a compiler was both, right? Um, it still is, but um, the fact that you can decouple the type checker from the actual build pipeline is something that you you know you can sort of pick and choose. This is sort of the like a la carte thing that we talked about before, where like 
I pick my own like format or I pick a, a linter that is like not built in. And then I also have like a build tool along with my type checker, right? Um, fun fact, or that's how I actually met Orta was like investigating, you know, how, whether or not it made sense to try to like help support the Babel team, you know, integrate TypeScript and whatnot. Um, we were trying to understand like people's workflows and things like that and the difficulties of why they weren't using TypeScript a lot of the time. Um, so that's, that's some, that's some, I don't know. It's a nice memory. <laughs> I think so. We do have a question. Um, sure. The question is, what is the process you use for managing TypeScript project? Can anyone contribute? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I, I think we have some like incredibly prolific contributors that I'm like surprised about sometimes. Um, they they work very hard, but like they started out with I think a couple of small pull requests that were approachable. Uh, we try to we try to mark pull requests as good first issues, um, and we also typically give them like difficulty tags. So um, help so like help wanted is is just like we're looking for PRs. Good first issue is like a hey please please this is like an easy one if you can if you're willing to put in the work um, you can totally. We do try this. to avoid those too. Yeah, yeah, we try to we try to keep those up for grabs for like other people. I won't um, triage it that way if I feel like oh this seems like a fun. This one used to be it. Like, yeah, I'm about to do. I'm about to fix it. Right. Uh, exactly. Um, but then like you know if you if you're willing to just ping people on the team and like um, talk through it and you've also like followed the contributing guidelines, um, then we're we're happy to try to help you. I think like the investment pays off long term. And it doesn't have to be something where like you're committed to it. You might just say like, this is, seems like a cool bug. I've never worked on a compiler. I've never worked on like a language service before, which is kind of novel in itself. Um, so I, I think that that's definitely um, easy. And compared to other projects I recently tried, like if you have NPM and Node, like you're already able to run the test suite. Like you don't need like a, you don't need a Docker configuration. We do support that. We have like some stuff built in. Like for dev containers, but you don't need that. You just need Node and NPM, and you can like run the compiler, which is pretty nice. That's really yeah, great. It's all just what, JavaScript. Yeah. That's cool. What kind of turnaround can somebody expect? So if somebody pings you and says, hey, I'm really interested in this issue, um, what kind of interactions can they expect from you? Something that, I don't know, do you have an SLA where you respond within X number of we days, a week? Yeah, we don't have an SLA. Um, I would say like, I would want to say if you get the attention of the person who triaged um, or someone who's a domain expert in the PR, you can you can get like answers pretty quickly. It's not perfect, right? Like it's it's like missing an email, right? That can happen. Um, like I mean, GitHub issues are plentiful, like Ooh. right. <laughs> um, so we we you know it's it's tough. Um, I would just say be persistent if you're really interested. Like I I, I apologize if you ever do get if, if you're like our post just falls off the radar but i think we want to do better and we want to do well by by contributors we have a backup plan too which is the typescript community discord there's like a section in there for people that are sort of understanding typescript compiler api and the internals of it and people are chatting in there most days so it might not be a typescript team member giving you the advice that you're looking for if you're like stuck in the middle of a bug but it might be somebody that has already contributed before and has a good general sense. That's a good point. I'm I'm continuously impressed by some of the people who are using our APIs for different things. Um, and the and the Discord's a great place. Like not just if you're a contributor, like also if you're just learning TypeScript too. Um, if you have like questions, there's like a questions area as well. There's like a how to ask questions. Yeah, there's thing. like 10 plus simultaneous questions going on most of the time. Um, and they all have their own little channels. It's really cool. Yeah. We have another question. Um, was there a tipping point for TypeScript to become famous? Um, I think everyone likes to say that the tipping point was when Angular announced that they were going to be using it, like if you, there's like some chart of <laughs> of searches per day on Google for TypeScript, and like you look around like May of I don't know 2015 or something like that, and then it just like shoots up. Um, 
and so that's that's when like people were like, oh, this is a serious technology. Um, it's weird because like I am super biased and I pay attention like that. I paid attention to dev tools a lot. So like I remember when it first came out, I was in college. I was talking to my friends. I'm like, oh, have you heard about this TypeScript thing? And they're like, huh, what? Like I did, didn't know or care. Um, but I think like that was one of the things. And um, I think Babel was the next big sort of explosion because people. Yeah, I th I think I think that it was a big. I don't know if it was more famous, but it was a huge milestone, right? Because like if you knew about it, you could now use it. If you ha already had like an existing build system, that was the that was a big thing. Um, I don't I think, think if I, you I, yeah. if you if you've ever seen the the sort of stages of growth sort of charts. I think like Angular was the first sort of early stage adopters, and then like the Babel uh, system was like adopters. Like it was the first point where like the vast majority of these JavaScript projects could start using TypeScript without going entirely in on TypeScript for every single thing that they needed in their ecosystem. Yeah, I, I right because I think like there's a, there's a difference between like awareness and like everyone's using it, and I do remember like going to different conferences and like getting different feedback over time. Like I remember I went to like a node conference and like I literally overheard like a couple of speakers being like, I don't know what this TypeScript thing is. Like, is it the next coffee script? Whatever. Like, I don't want to like think about all these technologies that are going to be dead in like three years. Um, and, and like these were, this was a common perception. Um, and then all of a sudden, like, it seemed like, I mean, if you look, if you look at survey results, which I know there's a lot of bias in, but like if you look at the results and you see like something like sixty to seventy percent of users are saying like they use TypeScript in their projects, that's it's not something that we believed was going to happen um, in this time frame, right? Like that shocks us still. We have a few more questions, um, and I think I the next. This one is one of my favorite things to talk about, <laughs> really. So the question is, uh, is there some way to partially move a project to 100% TypeScript in a monorepo approach? So I think they mean, is there a way to partially move a web space or a project within a monorepo? For example, just moving the utility functions, but not the React components. I think a good uh, process for this is to think about that sort of uh, spectrum we mentioned earlier. Like uh, a good example of this is Chrome DevTools. Um, that's you know the inspector when you command uh, uh, no, right click on a thing and then look at the list of all the elements. That was originally a large JavaScript project, and they thought that they wanted to move towards something like TypeScript. So the first thing that they did was they sort of added um, JS Doc, which is a uh, JS Doc is an old documentation format that TypeScript effectively like became the main uh, like usage for in modern code, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, I, I don't see many JS Doc generated web pages, so uh, yeah, that's my yeah, main yeah. argument against that. Um, and what ended up happening is they got a lot of the power of TypeScript editing support uh, into the project first. And so rather than jumping straight from JavaScript to TypeScript, they had a stopping point where they said, we're going to make JS doc support throughout the entire system. And then once that's good and stable and we're happy with it, uh, then we will evaluate whether we should move from JS doc to TypeScript. Yeah, I think I think like the thing that we've typically talked about is um, you start from the, the, the leaves of, well, I don't know if leaves are the right term, but like the roots maybe. Um, the things that like have no dependencies in a project, um, you want to start typing those more and more. Once you have those, other people can consume them, right? That it just sort of makes sense because the types can be inferred from those from those modules. Um, the hardest things are the things. I mean, it's hard because like the complexity usually lies in the things that have those dependencies. And they have to like funnel types around between other different dependencies. So you, it's it's unfortunate that you don't get faster feedback of like, oh, this type is actually the types are helping me. Um, but yeah, I think like that 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 slider approach, that incremental approach, plus like starting up from like the things that don't have a lot of um, dependencies is the right one. We do have a migration guide on the website. It's pretty good. 
but I wrote it, so like I'm biased. Uh, it not has bad. a lot of the advice. It, the advice has not changed fundamentally in in years, right? Like it starts out like ad types, maybe JS stock, then start turning on the straightness flags. Then you're starting to like really get the benefits of the type tracker. Yeah, and there's a good tactic that uh, I was taught by Google engineers, which is um, you use a type alias on any. So you you rename any basically to be something like migration any, and you or can sort of me. like yeah, you can just make all these chunks of of code that you know should eventually change that um, are just allowing you to get away with things as you're going through the migration process, and then you can you know, do a search on your entire project for those migration any's once you're in a more stable state too. Yeah, it also happens for like really big projects that adopt TypeScript where like they're going to, they have so much code that like a minor version change on TypeScript could like impact them. So when they upgrade, they'll just have like a cast or a type assertion to say like as TypeScript 4.3 migration, right? And or I guess four three is not the area, but but you get <laughs> the idea. Yeah, like by the time this video, well, like you'll see it and you'll be excited for four three coming out. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. I believe we have one last question, and that might have to be the last one. What does your day to day uh, work look like working at Microsoft? Is it going through issues and PRs all day? Or is there an internal advocacy role as well? It's weird because like the advocacy thing is, I think like for a PM at Microsoft, that is an implicit expectation to some extent. Um, but like, I think one of the things that when I was an engineer on the team, um, that was something that I enjoyed doing at least a little bit of, or at least like interfacing with our community in different ways. Um, and so like, I think anyone's free to do that as long as like messaging is pretty like reasonable, right? I think like, and also we have different viewpoints on the team, which kind of like, we, all, we always kind of like start with a caveat, like, hey, this is just my opinion, but, um, um, but then, but then you know you're you're trying to keep track of like the ecosystem as well. Uh, for my end, you're trying to yeah watch the issue tracker as well. Um, and then there are also just like other other questions from like different partner teams that you end up needing to like try to answer. Like it, I think the roles are different and they're defined by both like the person, your manager, and like you know the team, right? What the team needs at any given time changes. Um, I don't know if Ordo wants to answer that differently or same or whatever, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess my, my experience is quite drastically different because I'm both a very remote engineer. Um, I actually, I think the time zone difference between us is somewhere around eight hours from right. <laughs> uh, Dublin to uh, Seattle. Um, and so I do spend quite a lot of time just like, at, you know, doing GitHub issues, uh, answering questions in the community that's like during a time zone when no one else is doing that too. Um, uh, and then sort of catching up with everybody when everybody, when during that sort of overlap few hours, like right now effectively. Um, and so I do get, to, as a programmer, I do get spent quite a lot of time just like focusing on sort of hard technical problems that is, you know, the end result being that people get better experiences either in the web docs or TypeScript itself. Yeah, I guess I used to be more of a night owl on the issue tracker as well. I guess I sometimes still am. And so like that was <laughs> right, a little bit of what you got there. <laughs> yeah. But maybe to more extreme now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Daniel 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 spends a lot of time just writing the blogs nowadays. There's, there's <laughs> one every 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 few months. They're always yeah, the we, same. Why what are you copying and pasting between them? We, it's, it's funny because from that, like it used to be, um, we moved to like a two month release process a couple of years ago. And like, eventually that was like almost killing me uh, <laughs> because, you know, with that frequency, you have to have a beta and like the full release. Now we actually have three per release. So it's like not any better, right? We're releasing every month, every three months. But, um, but we, I guess, 
maybe this is interesting in some way. Like uh, I've started treating the blog posts kind of like the actual software that we're shipping in that like you have an, a beta blog post and you just iterate on the blog post. So like, yes, the content might look very similar. In fact, like the text might not change in a lot of places. I used to feel bad about that. Um, I don't anymore. <laughs> I mean, a little it's bit. It's actually right? like a great learning resource, all those posts. The blog posts? Yeah. I, I, keep, hearing, yeah. I keep hearing different yeah. things. <laughs> I, I think like the, I, the TypeScript nerds like us, right? Like we love it. Uh, and then, and then, um, I, I've, I recently was like hearing one podcast where it's like, what are people doing with TypeScript? Like I'm seeing the blog post, it seems like the craziest thing. <laughs> so I, and, and uh, one teammate said that um, his old dev manager, uh, if he ever wanted to like get fall asleep, he would just start reading the TypeScript blog post. <laughs> Because they're so oh. long. They're long. <laughs> and Sorry. people don't understand why we need some of these features a lot of the time, right? Because they're not yeah. the sort of things that you would use in your day-to-day -day programming unless you are doing like very specific library code. Yes. And 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 so like a lot of people say, like, why do I need this? And this is such a terrible feature, like they're just adding bloat. So these days, um, I try to prefix a little bit of that and, and give context and say, like, here's why you would use this. I even go back now and I try to say like, here's the base feature. Like if you have never seen this before, because chances are you might not, especially if you're like, should I learn this type of thing? And you're like, look at the blog post and you're like, Ooh, very no. added couple types and different <laughs> yeah. positions. Yeah. Like that's not, that's not the thing that we expect most users to use. Um, so I think that's, that's just been a, a thing that we've had to kind of like internalize to um, and figure that out as well. Um, but, but you know, I, I am glad that it, people people who go through the release notes do find value in them. So, like, I'm I'm very happy to hear you say that. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think they provide a really good sort of spectrum of documentation. Um, we have to both provide reference material as well as sort of guide people through this, the the cases of the individual uh, bits. So I think the release notes have always done a pretty solid job of being like something that you can get excited to read about every quarter. Okay, amazing. thank you a lot. I think we ran out of time. It was an amazing session. Uh, time for our next speaker.